My name is Alan Roebuck. I'm the past president of the Atmospheric Sciences section. I'd like to welcome you to the Jacob Bjerknes lecture. One of, and after this is over, uh, we will have the Charney lecture in, in the same session. When I was president of this section almost a year ago, I invited Steve Schneider to give this lecture. And uh, unfortunately, he's not with us now. And Tim Palmer was next on our list, and he's graciously agreed to, to come. So I, I just, t Steve, as you know, was a friend and colleague to many of us, a wonderful scientist and science communicator. So I'd just like to ask for a moment of silence to honor Steve Schneider. Thanks very much. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Peter Webster, who is our president-elect, who will introduce the speaker. Uh, Tim Palmer tells me that the longer the introduction, it means the conveners have uh, less confidence in the speaker. So you can judge what I think about Tim's talk uh, by the length of what I'm going to say. Um, Tim is a professor, the, the Royal Society Re Research Professor at Oxford University. He's also head of the uh, Probabilistic Forecast and Diagnostic Division of the ECNWF, and currently also a, uh, a, a professor, the Rothschild Distinguished Professor at Cambridge. And he's done something that neither Hooke nor Newton ever did, which is hold concurrent uh, professorships at uh, Oxbridge. Um, he was uh, educated in Britain, you'll, you'll notice that when he speaks, and uh, he has a Doctor of Philosophy, Doctor of Science from Oxford. He's a fellow of almost everything worth being a fellow of, and uh, uh, most recently a fellow of Jesus College and the Royal Society. Um, he um, uh, uh, has many prizes which match the marvelous research record that he has. He's one of uh, three or is it four people who have got the, both the Rosby and the Charney Award in the last 50 years, uh, got both awards from the AMS. Uh, he has the Royal Society Adrian Gill um, a Medal, and this goes on for a long time, so I won't go any further. But what I will say is that Tim is a very special researcher, and I think in our field of atmospheric predictability, he has been the person who has uh, defined probabilistic forecasting techniques and work with ECMWF to make them applicable to real problems in society. Now he started his career in quantum mechanics and general relativity theory, but then he became a meteorologist. And after a while, he started to develop this keen understanding of nonlinearity and uncertainty in numerical weather prediction. And most recently, uh, he's gone back to uh, his quantum mechanics and introduced some of the chaos theory that he has learnt from, uh, uh, from numerical weather prediction, sort of a, a reverse way of doing things, and started to question some of the attendants of, of, of quantum mechanics. He also is a distinguished musician, a dedicated golfer, and I say you could probably call him a modern day renaissance man. So I'm very pleased to introduce Professor Tim Palmer as a 2010 Bjorkness lecturer. Well, thank you, Peter. Um, I'm not sure that was a long or a short introduction. I take it as a medium introduction, which means your confidence is mm, <laughs> a, note of, a note of doubt. Um, well, it's a great uh, privilege and honor to be giving this lecture, although I have to say it is, of course, tinged with a bit of sadness, and I do recognize it should be Steve uh, giving the talk uh, today rather than me. Um, I, I have and always had a great uh, respect for Steve, and I think we shared a lot uh, in aspects of uncertainty uh, in prediction, climate prediction, and, and weather prediction. And I remember many uh, fine uh, discussions I had with Steve over the years in this topic. Um, I want to talk about uh, developments of climate models, uh, and indeed weather forecasting models, and bringing very much into the fore this area of uh, uncertainty and probability. But I, I want to start by noting that the, the name Bjerknes is absolutely 
uh, iconic uh, for meteorologists and oceanographers. And I think the name Björkness is perhaps uh, has a similar resonance as maybe the, the Kennedy uh, family has in U.S. politics. Because Björkness, um, you know, was not, was not one person. And in fact, in doing my research, uh, preparing this lecture, I, I, I stumbled, I didn't actually know this, that uh, the, the first of the famous Björknesses was actually Wilhelm Björknes's father, who himself was a distinguished uh, fluid dynamicist. But I will start with, with Wilhelm, um, who really was the one that set weather prediction on its scientific course. He proposed uh, to bring weather prediction into a problem in mathematical physics. He proposed that weather forecasting should be considered a deterministic initial value problem based on hard quantitative laws of physics. Um, and a very famous paper in 1904 where he set that out, so a little more than a century ago. Um, Jakob Birkness, his son, and I guess perhaps this lecture is principally named after him, uh, was also a pioneering figure, and I would perhaps in the theme of my talk like to say that he led uh, or he pioneered an understanding of the really the key mechanisms that lead to uh, seasonal timescale predictability to do with the coupling of the ocean uh, and the atmosphere. And um, an organization like uh, ECMWF, which I've you know, spent almost the last quarter of a century at, uh, which has been involved in both uh, medium-range forecasting and, and more recently seasonal forecasting, certainly owes a, a, a debt to the Björkness family as a whole. So it's a, it's a great honor to be giving this uh, lecture because it's entirely appropriate to the work I, I have been involved in for many a year. Now, I would say that most of Björkness's uh, contributions, the, the, the Björkness family's contributions, have really stood the test of time. Um, but perhaps if there was one fly in the ointment, it's the issue of determinism, uh, which, uh, which Wilhelm uh, proposed. And it was, uh, I guess, Lorentz that sort of put the uh, stake, as it were, into the corpse of uh, determinism. Gosh, that's a terribly overly... Uh, <laughs> I didn't really mean to say that, but anyway, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> um, uh, I'll move on. Um, through, through the uh, famous um, uh, butterfly effect. I thought I'd give you a, a, a more, a, a, I'm sure you've all seen the, the Lorentz uh, uh, model and how, how that leads to unpredictability. Let me just show you a more kind of, um, if I can get the pointer to work. Yeah, here we go. A more sort of relevant meteorological example. So here we have the weather uh, a couple of days before one of the most severe storms uh, to hit Britain ever hit Britain. This storm rendered the, the town of Seven Oaks. Uh, into no oaks, um, uh, uh, amongst other things. Um, and the poor uh, TV forecaster at the time uh, made uh, what, what is reckoned to be one of the worst forecasts in the history of British, me British meteorology. Although he always says the thing he regretted was not actually making the bad forecast, but not copywriting the TV clip of him making the bad forecast, <laughs> because it's been shown so many times over the last uh, couple of decades that he'd now be uh, you know, a multimillionaire. Anyway, so what we're looking at now is uh, um, two weather maps which are identical but for a, a sprinkling of Lorenz's uh, butterflies um, at, at this time. It's a couple of days before the storm. And we're going to animate this by moving the model forward in time or running, running the uh, ECMWF weather forecast model on this initial state uh, from these two uh, initial conditions. And lo and behold, let's have a look. So there's the model taking the surface pressure forward in time to um, a couple of days, about two and a half days from that initial time. And if you look at the bottom map, you see this intense vortex, which is completely absent in the top one. So the forecaster pretty much would have said, well, there's a bit of a ridge coming in, it's going to be a nice day, whereas, in fact, the mother of all uh, storms actually happened. So that's a very kind of graphic uh, illustration of uh, chaos and unpredictability applied to the real uh, system, as well as Laurent 63. So what do we do about this, uh, you know, this situation these days? Now, this would not have been possible back in 1987. We didn't have the technology and the computers weren't big enough. But what we do nowadays is we run our forecast models many, many times over, 50 times over, in fact, 100 times over every day, uh, with these uh, Lorenzian butterflies, if you like, added to the initial conditions, representing inherent uncertainty in the initial conditions, and uh, this is a, a, what we call set, set of stamp maps, 
um, showing actually this was a phenomenally unpredictable uh, weather event. So you can see everything from you know, intense vortices to pretty much, well, here's a nice ridge of high pressure, every type of weather you could think about. I mean, this was exceptionally unpredictable. So what, was, what does one do with all of that? Well, the answer is you boil it down into a probabilistic forecast. So we do, in a sense, have to modify Bjerknes' deterministic uh, paradigm or deterministic dream, but his, his basic notion that this is a problem amenable uh, to the laws of physics, this is a scientifically uh, you know, um, appropriate problem, weather prediction, as long as one modifies it to take into account this inherent uh, um, probabilistic nature of the problem, then that brings us from determinism pretty much into the present day. So this is actually a probability based on just frequentist counting of those uh, stamp maps of the chance of hurricane force winds, or in fact gusts of wind, um, sort of, well, here through the English Channel. So, uh, I don't know, I mean, if you wanted to sail your, your yacht across the English Channel that, that day, I suppose that's up to you. Uh, you know, you'd have to assess your cost-loss ratio, and, uh, you know, if that was uh, less than the probability of the storm, you might decide to do it or, or not. I think the point is, here's a tool for uh, decision making uh, you, you know, across a range of sectors that properly accounts for the flow dependent uncertainty that exists. I should explain, I mean, this was an exceptional case and for most situations, of course, a two day weather forecast is actually quite reliable. And that's entirely consistent with the idea in Lorentz's model that some initial conditions are very predictable, other initial conditions near the unstable parts of the attractor are very un unpredictable. So this is, a, this is in a sense a forecast near the un, un, at least an unstable part of the real climate attractor. Okay, uh, and uh, of course seasonal forecasting is exactly the same nowadays. So we run an ensemble. This is the ECMWF uh, seasonal forecast of Nino 3, actually pretty much from the latest uh, date, 2010. Uh, so this is, this is showing actually a somewhat, a somewhat um, predictable trend back towards normal SSTs from the La Nina type situation we've been having uh, the last few months. But even by, say, summer of next year, we're probably likely to be still in a kind of negative SST st Pacific state, although not as much as it has been, although you see there's this one prediction which goes over zero. Anyway, making the point that also um, Bjerknes, uh, Jakob Bjerknes' uh, insights have led to the development of these types of schemes, but again, we have to think probabilistically to really extract the proper scientific content and indeed to make forecasts that are, are useful and relevant for decision making. Okay, but what I really want to talk about in this talk is kind of moving on to the climate arena and asking why do we have uh, uncertainty in uh, uh, not only in weather forecasts, but in climate forecasts as well. And as well as initial uncertainty, which I've sort of dealt with to some extent, chaos, uh, for longer term climate prediction, obviously we have to worry about uh, what the future emissions of greenhouse gases will be. That's manifestly uncertain because of, uh, we don't know what's going to happen post uh, Cancun or whatever the next one is in, in uh, South Africa and so on. So that's a kind of source of uncertainty, and that's why mostly people talk about projections rather than predictions, projections predicated on particular emission scenarios. But there's this third element here, which is the one I want to dwell on, because in some sense, as one goes to longer and longer timescales, this becomes a more and more dominant source of uncertainty. As we'll see, actually, model uncertainty is, is also uh, important for medium range and seasonal prediction. But as we go out to the sort of longer decadal, multi-decadal, centennial timescales, uh, model uncertainty becomes a really paramount uh, uh, um, issue in assessing uh, reliability of predictions. Um, so models, I mean, life was simple back in the 1970s, uh, um, although actually it wasn't that simple even then. But uh, So uh, here we see, this is a very familiar slide, I'm sure to a lot of people, showing how Earth system models, attempts to attempts to represent in a computation or in a mathematical form the entire climate system that is relevant to climate change in as a comprehensive a way as possible. That's an Earth system model. Um, so you can see over the years they've become uh, more and more complex, now involving atmosphere, land surface, ocean, various aerosols, and now a lot of work in putting chemistry in and so on and so forth. 
But at the heart, there's this kind of essential paradigm that the equations, the fundamental equations of climate, we think we know. Uh, the equations here of a fluid governed by Newton's laws of motion expressed by the Navier-Stokes equations. We think we know these. As partial differential equations, we know these equations. We know the laws of thermodynamics. We know the continuity equation. So in some sense, the real guts of the climate problem, the fluid dynamics, the thermodynamics, are things that we know as, as, as mathematical entities. But the problem comes in trying to solve these equations. How do, how do we actually solve them? And, you know, as, although this is a marvelously beautiful equation, and, in, you know, I always wonder at this, that with sort of 23 or so mathematical symbols, you can describe every single uh, component of motion in the atmosphere and the oceans and, and elsewhere, from the smallest, just me moving my hands up and down and the air around me moving, to the longest meanders of, of the jet streams in the atmosphere and the gulf streams in the ocean, all, all described by these 23 mathematical symbols. I still wonder at how phenomenal that sort of concept is. But to actually solve these equations, of course, is, is, is another matter. And the traditional method is to project them onto, uh, onto some sort of suitable uh, basis set, which could be grid points, or in the case of ECMWF, it's spherical harmonics, or there are other different types, of, uh, uh, pro uh, different types of basis functions to project these equations onto, essentially converting them into a very large number of ordinary differential equations, which then can be solved with numerical techniques. But the problem comes that you've got to somehow represent stuff that you can't resolve because the computers aren't just big enough. And in a sense, this is where the heart of uncertainty comes in because we have to apply, uh, traditionally apply simple uh, deterministic formulae which might take the variables, the, the pressure and temperature and winds at the truncation scale as input and a number of free parameters and out would come some uh, kind of averaged tendency due to all the stuff that you, you've neglected. So in terms of momentum it could, in the atmosphere, it could be turbulent eddies in the boundary layer, it could be orographic uh, gravity waves uh, propagating up from the ground up into the, potentially up into the stratosphere. It could be about momentum transport by convective clouds. There's a whole load of physical processes that have to be somehow uh, represented in some approximate way. So these are very much semi-empirical equations. They're not based in any rigorous way on the laws of physics. They're based on observations and plausible assumptions about how the processes work. Now, uh, oh, so here's an example. Uh, so a, a deep convex is a schematic of a deep convective cloud. Uh, this might have scales of a few tens of kilometers. So typically, subgrid scale for a climate model, which might have a grid spacing of, say, a couple of hundred kilometers. And the notion behind that uh, deterministic uh, formula is that there's a whole sort of statistical ensemble of, of these convective clouds within a grid box. So in some sense, we can meaningfully talk about the ensemble average of all the individual processes. So each individual process might not uh, be predictable, but in some sort of ensemble sense, we can say something meaningful about the statistical effect of all these processes on the grid scale variables. So it's this notion that there is a, uh, an ensemble of subgrid processes feeding the grid scale variables, which actually kind of um, justifies that deterministic formula, which has been very traditional, the traditional way in which we've developed models. So as I say, deterministic closures, essentially these parameterizations are closure equations, ways to close the equations. I mean, they have a venerable history. This is Reynolds, Boussinesque, Smagorinsky, I'm sure a lot of you know that. Um, so, I, and I'm sure it was the past masters at fluid dynamics that kind of uh, motivated and, and inspired the teams of people from the Chani et al. team through the 50s and 60s into developing uh, these types of subgrid closures for climate models, weather and climate models. However, there's a but. Uh, so let's start by actually looking at the real world. So this is an animation of Go's uh, imagery over the Western Pacific. I really want to focus you to focus on these. These are the convective clouds bubbling up. Uh, your eyes might be distracted by a couple of typhoons, but try not to look too much at those. <laughs> um, this is about a 10 by 10 degree box. So a grid box of a, of a GCM is just some fraction of one of these boxes. 
And what you're seeing really, uh, if, if I can do it again, I don't know, uh, is not really uh, an ensemble of, of clouds, but a few kind of individual ones within these small grid boxes. There isn't this enormous kind of statistical uh, ensemble of, over which to average, but a relatively small number. This can be made a little bit more, um, a little bit more kind of quantitative by looking, and this is a famous paper by Nastrom and Gage some years ago, look, and this has been sort of uh, shown over and over again by other investigators. If you look at the uh, spectrum of, of energy in the atmosphere as a function of scale from tens of thousands of kilometers down to uh, individual kilometers, you don't really see any notion of a scale separation between the kind of what would be resolved scales and stuff to be parameterized. It's not like there's a big gap and then there's a whole load of stuff which exists in some ensemble that you can average over. You see this rather kind of uh, continuous uh, decrease uh, in energy, which has this power law, in fact, power law structure, and, and the power law is actually rather shallow. This minus 5 over 3 has some very interesting um, up, up and down scale properties, which I don't really have time to talk about now. But the main point is there isn't a kind of a, 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 a scale separation, but rather this power law decrease. Now, the power law is quite consistent with what one might deduce from the Navier-Stokes equations in terms of its symmetry properties. The very fundamental scaling symmetry, one can, if you have a solution of a velocity and pressure, you can find uh, alternative solutions by scaling uh, space and time, which is saying there's a, there's a kind of scale invariant property to that underlying PDE. And, of course, the very notion of of deterministic parameterization, this, this uh, kind of uh, imagining this uh, scale separation between the resolved and the to be parameterized scales is clearly inconsistent with that notion of a, of a scaling symmetry. So we are kind of violating what is a fundamental property of the equations. And the, and the, the issue is, does it matter? You might say this is, this is rather kind of esoteric and it doesn't really matter as long as we kind of do a half-decent job on the, on the subgrid scales. It shouldn't really matter too much. But I'm going to argue that may not be sim as simple as that. Now, I'm by no means the first person to recognize this. This was a cartoon by um, uh, Daniel Scherzer and Sean Lovejoy back, back uh, many years ago now who kind of recognized this issue. I mean, this is a rather brutal diagram. I'm, I'm glad this was in the days before color transparencies were... Invented, but it shows, uh, you know, here, we are, here I am, or here you have a you know, GCM modeler uh, butchering these, these poor defenseless partial differential equations. We're doing gross violation to them. Okay. Okay, well, as I say, you might argue it doesn't matter, but one should bear some. And I say that I'm showing this because it's an IPCC quote, so it's not, and I didn't write this, by the way. So this is coming from, I'm not trying to. Um, I'm not trying to criticize IPCC, I'm trying to actually quote from IPCC because they recognize themselves. This is a problem. Models still show significant errors, although these are generally greater at smaller scales. Important large-scale problems also remain. The ultimate source of most such errors is that many important small-scale processes cannot be represented explicitly in models and so must be included in approximate form as they interact with, with larger scale features. This dots actually is a few things like, you know, um, El Nino Southern Oscillation, Madden Julian Oscillation, Quasi Biennial Oscillation, North, and I'm not going to sort of list them, but they list a lot of these uh, fundamental modes of variability where models still have problems. And as a result, they say models continue to display a substantial range of global temperature change in response to specified greenhouse gas forcing. Um, this is a slide I got from uh, Lenny Smith, um, who kind of makes this a little bit more apparent. So this is a, a slide that, or a, a figure that's probably familiar to many of you from IPCC. And it seems to be showing that the models are doing a pretty good job in, in following the actual observed uh, temperature uh, trends, which are, the, well, temperature of the, over the 20th century, which, are the, which is the black line. The red is the ensemble average. But... Perhaps what's not made clear in this is that what's actually happening is that each model, there's a whole bunch of models have gone into this, each model has had its bias subtracted out before this has been plotted. So you're looking at anomalies relative to the model's own climatology. 
And if you don't do that, if you don't, if you don't, uh, it, if the y-axis isn't anomalies, model anomalies, but the actual kind of temperature in, in Celsius without any bias correction, you see actually there's a phenomenal range of spread of the models. Some models are enormously biased against observations, and the, and the, and the spread of the models is quite gigantic compared with the, uh, the trend in the, in, the, in the signal. So it's just illustrating the point that we have these biases, and I think it's true to say we just don't know yet how to close these equations with such deterministic formulae and produce a model which has no significant biases against observations. And so a major component of climate prediction uncertainty lies in the mathematical formulation of the closure term. Um, so, you know, I mentioned that Earth system models purport to be comprehensive representations of the climate system, comprehensive in the sense of having all the variables that you think should be relevant to making predictions, but actually one variable that isn't included in any individual Earth system model, one, one prognostic variable, is actually uncertainty. Predicting uncertainty is not a prognostic variable. It's a missing box in the current generation of Earth system models. So what do we do, um, what does the community do about trying to estimate model uncertainty? Well, the, the kind of state of the art is the coordinated uh, multi-model ensemble. So the, the couple model into comparison project, CMIP has been doing a very successful uh, program in, into comparisons and creating these multi-model systems for uh, IPCC. And we've the, the CMIP 5, of course, project is the latest one, which will feed into AR5. And of course, the idea there is that we can poll across the different models and assess uncertainty by looking at you know, how tight or or how broad the distribution is. But of course, I think as everybody who is involved in this game knows, there are problems with this approach because it kind of assumes there are no underlying problems that are common to all of the individual CMIP models. And, you know, clearly that's not the case, that, that all of the models are based on the same sort of type of deterministic bulk formula parameterization. They're all you know, they go from the PDEs to the computational representations with the same kind of, same approach, the same generic approach, projection onto basis functions, deterministic closure equations. So there is this danger, and they all typically would have the same resolution as well because of comp computers are only so big. So there is this danger that there may be a kind of a structural error common to all of the models that is not being taken into account um, in, in a type of uh, multi-model ensemble. There is another, well, and there's another pragmatic approach in a, in a multi-model ensemble, which is you're limited by the number of models available. So if there are only 15 models, you can only get a 15-model uh, ensemble, and that may be deemed not to be sort of large enough to produce meaningful statistics. So another approach which the Met Office has, has pioneered, and actually uh, Oxford as well, with Miles Allen's climateprediction.net, is actually taking a single model and perturbing those parameters alpha in my formula according to what one considers sort of error bars on their, on their values. Now, if you think that uh, multi-model ensembles kind of uh, are blind to structural errors, then the perturbed parameter approach is blind squared, if you like, to, to structural errors, because everything is predicated on one particular model and one particular set of, 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 uh, of deterministic formulae P. So what I want to talk about is a third approach uh, which is coming out of uh, numerical weather prediction and I think the time is ripe for it now to sort of start to, to have an impact in climate prediction which is actually what at first sight might seem strange which is that although the, uh, at the level of PDEs, partial differential equations, uh, the system is deterministic, the proposal is at the level of the computational level the equations actually should be considered stochastic i.e. there should be some kind of random noise in the system somehow. So just uh, formally, we're, formally, we're replacing these deterministic formulae by stochastic formulae, um, which would be consistent with power law scaling and sym scaling symmetries. And because they're stochastic, they have inherent inbuilt means to represent uncertainty by, by running ensembles and therefore um, uh, pool, uh, by uh, drawing from the stochastic process is randomly, so you have different draws each time you do a different ensemble member. Um, yeah, you see I've, I've put here, you know, potentially you've got a range of scales. It's not just all at one scale and it can overlap with the truncation scale. Uh, one idea which I've 
been sort of pursuing over the years a bit is the idea of, of cellular automata, for example, to re represent convective systems. Um, they, can, they, they, they can have rules governed, for example, by the underlying CAPE, co co uh, convective available potential energy. One thing about cellular automata is that they can easily be coded to propagate or advect, say, with the, with the underlying wind, and therefore information can move from grid box to grid box at the sub-grid level, which is completely sort of different to a conventional parameterization where the information really only carries from one grid box to the other at the resolved scales. So this it does introduce a different type of sort of um, uh, process which may be missing in, 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 uh, con in um, conventional parameterizations. Now, I'm not going to kind of, I, I, I've, in giving this talk, I've decided not to kind of go into, into technical details. Um, if you're interested in this in, in, in detail, so we have implemented these schemes in our numerical weather prediction system at, at ECMWF uh, for the last few years. So you can download from the ECMWF website a technical memorandum so you can real, you can sort of have, have all the stochastic equations to your heart's content if you want to get into it. And I was just down in the, uh, in the exhibits hall and Cambridge University Press have one copy left of a book which uh, Paul Williams and I so rushed down. Uh, it, uh, it's actually not too late to order it for Christmas if one of your loved ones wanted to give you a... <laughs> Sorry, am I, am, I, am I transgressing the rules of the... Yes, I am. Okay, <laughs> I'll move on then. Um, uh, I, so actually, uh, I, as I mentioned, I mean, a lot of very venerable scientists uh, who, who have worked on, on fluid modeling from a deterministic point of view. But I, I want to just bring out these two kind of pioneers in the field, which I think this approach is consistent with. One is L.F. Richardson, who, by the way, took on Bjerknes's mantle and really sort of produced the, the first numerical weather forecast based on Wilhelm Bjerknes's ideas. But he also is, the, is essentially the, 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 the father of the fractal, as, as Benoit Mandelbrot, who died recently, acknowledged. Um, the fractal and you know the, the scaling symmetries that I talked about and Paolo's are very much kind of consistent with this idea of fractals, fractal um, structures going right down to the subgrid scale and beyond. And of course Ed Lorentz himself, and this is a nice quote from one of his papers in 1975, so quite some time ago, I believe that the ultimate climate models will be stochastic, i.e. random numbers will appear somewhere in the time derivatives. So if he said it, right, must be true. So I want to talk about four kind of consequences of, of moving in this direction towards a more overtly stochastic or probabilistic climate model. Um, one is this notion of uh, uncertainty, uh, predictions of uncertainty. And um, I just want to show you a result from a project, uh, a, a, a European Union project called Ensembles, which had a number of partners uh, in Europe. Um, where we looked at seasonal predictions um, and tried to evaluate the skill of seasonal forecasts, so very much the Jakob Bjerknes uh, kind of uh, paradigm, um, with a number of different types of ensemble systems. The, the classic kind of multi-model ensemble, such as the CMIP would have, the perturbed parameter ensemble that I spoke about, and the stochastic physics uh, ensemble. Um, and what we're looking at are skill scores for different uh, land areas from Australia down to North Asia. I think there are 20-odd regions. Um, we're looking at skill scores for June, um, June, July, August forecast initialized on the 1st of May. So looking at months two to four. Uh, this is dry and wet, a tercile. So we're looking at probabilities of, of, uh, of being in the lower tercile or the upper tercile, similarly for DJF. What I've just done here is which of the different ensemble systems scores best for any particular region and, and any particular event, taken over a, whatever that is, a 15-year uh, period, roughly. Um, well, w the default was actually have to have no representation of model uncertainty at all, so just initial condition uncertainty. And then uh, 8 out of 84 of these, that turned out to be best, so roughly 10%. So that's kind of within statistical sampling that you'd expect that. Um, but the, overall, the best system was actually the stochastic physics with 45% of cases, 38 out of 84 best, the multi-model coming in second best for these particular scores. So it is showing, at least in this seasonal, and, and you know, seasonal forecasting is a, is a, is a problem 
which, where we have verification data. So unlike the climate change prediction where we don't know what's going to happen, as it were, seasonal forecasts, we do know what's going to happen. Um, many of the processes, ocean atmosphere coupling, atmosphere land coupling and so on, are common to seasonal and the longer time scales. So I would argue this, this is relevant to uh, climate change. And at the very least, it's showing that these stochastic models are starting to become competitive with, let's say, uh, the more traditional multi-model ensembles. But I want to show you something else, which at first sight may seem uh, sort of strange, that the stochastic closures could actually be more accurate than the traditional closures. And I, I'm going to try and demonstrate that through a study of model bias. So this actually is the, um, the 500 hectopascal height bias of the standard uh, ECMWF um, seasonal forecast model, which is showing a kind of tendency of the model to have a rather an overly strong, well, westerly flow. It's kind of consistent with, with being projecting onto a positive northern annular mode, if you like. Uh, this is run at a typical kind of climate resolution of maybe a couple of hundred kilometers. That's a spectral truncation. Now, we can increase the resolution of the model by, well, a factor of five or so, which computationally is very expensive. It's, you know, you, you square it and you have to add maybe qubit for the time step and maybe a bit more if you change vertical resolution as well. I mean, it clearly has a beneficial effect in terms of, so this is the response to in, increasing resolution. It's kind of filling out that bias that the, in, the, in the raw model. So it's, it's lessening that tendency towards a positive north, northern annular mode. But here's a, here's, this result is showing that um, adding what we call stochastic backscatter, um, I'm not going to actually dwell upon this, but this is a mechanism, again, which is sort of missing in conventional deterministic parameterization, where energy can, from, from subgrid scales can kind of start to backscatter up the spectrum. So we impose this on the resolved scales with a stochastic pattern generator. And the remarkable thing is that also reduces the bias of the model. So this, this is offsetting that bias in not a totally dissimilar way to the increased resolution. Now, at first sight, you might think it's odd that adding noise, why would noise kind of improve the bias of the model? You might want to think of a simple example of a potential well, so a belt ball bearing in a, in a potential well. But imagine the potential well is very skewed, so it's very steep on one side, and it's kind of shallow on the other side. So the ball bearing sits at, at the center of that, or the minimum of that well. But now let's introduce some noise, so it sort of jiggles around that minimum. Well, it hardly kind of goes up the steep side, but it might make long excursions onto the shallow side. And on average, then, its mean state will be translated in, a, in, in the direction of the shallow side of the well. So basically, in, a, in an underlying nonlinear system, even though the noise may be symmetric, it can induce a kind of rectification onto the flow and change the mean state. And in this particular case, it seemed to be beneficial. OK. I want to um, just talk about two other uh, ideas about this idea of, of probabilistic Earth system models, which I have to confess are slightly more speculative, because I don't have any hard results yet. But I feel, I feel quite good about this one and, and less certain about the, the last one. But I feel I, I'm going to mention both. Um, I went to a talk. Um, not long ago by the IBM chief engineer who's giving a talk at, at ECMWF in one of our uh, seminars we have on, on computing. And uh, he was talking about, you know, getting ready for exascale computers, so uh, 10 to the power 18 floating point operations per second, which he thought, you know, by 2017, 2018, we'll be starting to uh, get, get into. But he made this very interesting comment, which... Uh, I suppose like a lot of engineers, it's kind of somewhat underplayed until you try and realize what he's saying. So there will be a tension between energy efficiency and error detection. What he, what he was saying here, and I, I realized after a while this is really what he meant, that if you insist on bit reproducibility in your code, your computer models, you are going to pay a phenomenally high energy overhead for doing that. So it's going to restrict your computer's efficiency and operating speed and indeed energy consumption, if you insist on bit reproducibility. So, I mean, just unpacking it a bit more, he was kind of suggesting that, uh, that the end of bit reproducible determinism might be in sight for high-performance computing. Now, 
for me, this is music, as it were, to my ears, because this is exactly what uh, a stochastic uh, model could actually take advantage of and make use of this increased uh, energy efficiency and potentially increased speed. And I was quite uh, pleased to see, and I just would like to say I don't have any shares or interests, commercial interests in this company I'm about to tell you about, but I just happened to find it on the web in the summer called Lyric uh, Semiconductors, who are now making what they're calling a probability uh, processing computer. And they're claiming 1,000 times performance over today's digital processors. And the basic idea, perhaps you can, you can read it, but the basic idea is that by they're designing chips where you can sort of turn down the voltage across the transistors, making them no longer completely bit reproducible, but much, much, much more energy efficient and computationally active. So, you know, say for a thousand times increase in performance, you can go from 100% accuracy down to 90 something, 99% accuracy. And the claim is for many applications that might be okay. And uh, this is what I find extremely exciting, that this may be a, an area where this idea of stochastic climate models can actually interact with, uh, with computing hardware to make, essentially to continue the Moore's law, the, the increase in you know, doubling time every, every 18 months. But this is, this is a speculative idea, but nevertheless a quite interesting one as we move uh, into exascale computing. Um, the last sort of potential implication of what I'm talking about is, is something I do feel sort of strongly about, but on the other hand, I, I don't want to push my view too strongly here, but just to, to mention it. So this additional complexity in models, you know, comes with a price because typical institutes have finite uh, human resources. And when you're having to develop a whole range of new parameterizations for the atmosphere and deal with land surface and deal with oceans and aerosols and indeed chemistry and the cryosphere and so on and so forth. There are huge demands on human resources and I would perhaps even venture to say for many climate inst institutes the demands are just too great now. Um, so there is a potentially another approach which is that we try to actually pull our development teams. So, you know, individual institutes are not having to spend half of their resources kind of trying to replicate what somebody or some other institute has done in radiation or convection on a different platform and a different code, you know, on their own code. Maybe we can move towards a much more community-wide approach. Uh, I mentioned Air, I've got Airbus here because this is what happened in Europe to the civil aviation industry in the 60s where, you know, at the time it was a matter of national pride that Britain and Italy and France and Germany and everybody else had their own civil aircraft uh, manufacturers, but it was realized eventually this it was just putting too much demands on, on you know, with the technology of aeroplanes, too much demands on individual aerospace companies to produce independent aeroplanes. So Europe has got together and been successful, I think. And the question is, is this a good idea for climate modeling in the future? Now, often people take, and I have to say often institutional directors take a very dogmatic view about this, which is that this is a really bad idea. Um, I'd hate to think that they were just trying to ring fence their own budgets because of this, but anyway, I'm sure that I'm thinking too, too much too um, sarcastically. But anyway, the, the argument that comes out is that, um, no, 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 this is a really bad idea because we need model diversity uh, in order to be in order to be able to have some estimates of, of uncertainty. So, in other words, making the multi-model argument as a reason for developing multiple quasi-independent climate models. Now, you know, as I say, I don't want to argue against that, but I, I just would raise the issue that once we have uh, uh, an inherently probabilistic climate model, we can test this argument objectively, and that's my real point of this, is not to, to say yes or no, but we have a means of testing this, uh, if you like, dogmatic statement objectively, i.e., if we have a probabilistic climate model that we can test in weather and seasonal and maybe decadal prediction mode where we have verification, we can just see, is this, is this actually working out that the, that the multi-model ensembles are doing better than individual probabilistic climate models or not? And if it's not the case, then we can start thinking, I think, more constructively towards a more community-wide uh, development of, you know, what are essentially very important tools for framing policy uh, worldwide on this whole climate question. Um, so I want to sort of, uh, yellow light's coming on, so I'm going to sort of start wrapping up here. Um, first of all, you know, uh, in mod when we talk about modeling, of course, it covers a whole spectrum 
of things. And uh, you know, at one end of the spectrum, we have very idealized mathematical models which are tractable. We can get answers. We can solve them on you know, simple computers or even pencil and paper. They're very useful for understanding, for framing hypotheses. And then we have the types of models that I've talked about mostly in this lecture, you know, which can test these hypotheses. You might have, a, for example, you know, put sulfate aerosols in the stratosphere. Uh, you can frame a hypothesis that might help ops, offset uh, global warming with a simple model, but you really want to test that rigorously with a full, you know, full carbon cycle and everything else to see is that actually a sensible thing to do or not. So we need the, the comprehensive models. But I think in the past that this kind of uh, two, you know, this sort of slight dichotomy between the idealized models and the comprehensive models has also led to a bit of a, a, a kind of separation of the communities. And a paradigm which one often heard, I would say, in the 20th century, somewhat unkind, I suppose, to the, to the comprehensive modelers, is that, well, the academic community, you know, is the one that develops these mathematically tractable models to aid understanding, but it's the software engineers in the, in the MET institutes and so on that do the kind of brute force uh, modeling for quantitative predictions. And these two communities hardly, you know, interacted. And I really, sort of the purpose of this lecture to some extent is to say, well, as we're moving into the 20, well, we've already moved into the 21st century, I think we do need to kind of uh, throw this up paradigm away. And um, I think there is a kind of grand challenge here, which, because, yeah, because a lot of the, uh, uh, of the community who, who, who have worked with the more simple idealized models actually have great skills in stochastic representations of uh, processes that they don't want to, they don't want to model in, in great detail. So there's potentially an enormous body of, of synergy here between these two communities. And I think there's a real grand challenge here in trying to get the, the communities to work together uh, much more closely and constructively in developing next generation um, Earth system models with you know, what I'm calling innovative and uh, robust stochastic dynamic mathematics. And we kind of started on this route uh, recently. Um, Peter mentioned I, I spent a bit of time at, at Cambridge at a thing called the Isaac Newton Institute for Mathematical Sciences. And there's a program which has been running over the last four months or so, which is engaging you know, mathematicians, uh, climate models of different, uh, from different areas, statisticians together. Um, and this whole area of stochastic parameterization in climate models has been a key one. And the reason I'm showing you this is that we've, kind of coming out of this program, we've, we've uh, set up a network which um, at the moment has got about 200 people on it, uh, getting on for that anyway. Um, Judith Berner at NCAR uh, is kind of leading it with myself. Um, and we really are, you know, if, if any of what I've said is, uh, has any appeal to you, I would really try and encourage you to, to sign up and we're going to really start making this uh, network active. Um, in, the, uh, in the new year. Um, now, 55 seconds. I was just going to say, I'm almost sort of finished, but um, I wonder if 50, 49 seconds, I can just say, um, I, heard of, I, I went to a talk, I think it was in this room actually, of somebody um, talking about how climate scientists should become much more emotional about climate and um, go out there in the community and and kind of take off their fuddy-duddy um, kind of objective hats and start banging on the table for, for climate. And I just want to give you my own uh, read on this uh, very quickly, uh, post, as I say, post-Climate Gate and post-Cancun. And it could be a topic of discussion uh, over lunch or whatever if people are interested in. Because I, I myself have been quite involved in the UK, at least, with, uh, with you know, the, this whole kind of resurgence of climate skepticism in the last year or so. And the first point to make is that there clearly is a substantial body of opinion uh, with, uh, you know, who, who view that the, the cost of emissions cuts is not justified given current levels of uncertainty in climate predictions. And they're cleanly aware of these uncertainties. So that, I think, is, is a fact. There is this body, very substantial body of opinion, which does have considerable political attra uh, attraction um, that just says we can't afford uh, these emissions cuts. And I personally think that, you know, just repeatedly appealing to the precautionary principle and to, to one's grandchildren are actually very ineffective 
at, uh, at, at, in arguing against this body of opinion. Because for every picture of your grandchildren you bring out, they'll pick, bring a picture of their grandchildren and saying, I don't want my grandchildren to be brought up in a country that has been bankrupt by bad policy on you know, cutting carbon emissions. So they can play the, the grandchildren card just as effectively as we can. So um, my own feeling is that if we're going to, to move forward in what I think is, despite Cancun, a bit of a, well, a considerable stalemate, actually, um, I think we have to start asking ourselves as, as scientists, are we doing everything we can uh, to try and reduce some of these uncertainties in, in climate, prediction, climate predictions, and, and in particular about the feedbacks um, with climate. So are we, perhaps we mean, meaning scientists and government together, actually doing all we humanly can to assess whether climate change will be the catastrophe, which it could be, or, it, or something that we could live with and adapt to, which also it could be. And um, my own feeling is that if we ask this question, are we doing collectively all that we possibly can, I think I would only give perhaps seven out of ten to that question. I don't think we're doing all we can. Um, I'm going to move over this slide, which is a quote from IPCC about the fact that uh, there are still lots of uncertainties about cloud feedbacks and so on, and just really come to, uh, to sort of pretty much the last point of my talk. Because um, I think one of the things that we could do is to actually integrate this, if you like, the type of work that has been pioneered by the, by the Bjerknes father and son in initial value problems uh, into the climate change problem. And it's a process that's sometimes called seamless prediction. Climate and weather prediction actually kind of diverged somewhat in the, in the 1950s sort of and 60s. And perhaps only now is starting to come together again. What I've tried to show you in this talk is that um, the stochastic parameterization is an area which came out of numerical weather prediction, which could well improve the accuracy of climate models. But it's only one area. I mean, if I had another hour, I won't talk about it, but if I had another hour, I would also talk about how data assimilation, which is really something essential in, in weather prediction to initialize models, provides an enormously powerful tool to test uh, process-specific parameterizations like clouds and convection and so on. Uh, and the other thing is uh, the, the kind of resolution that numerical weather prediction models run at um, allow a much better specification of physical processes than the much coarser resolutions that climate models run at. Now, if we could bring to bear all of this machinery from the weather and seasonal prediction in a much more integrated way in climate change, I think then we could do a better job than we're currently doing. But the problem is that these are very computationally expensive. Data assimilation is enormously computationally expensive and obviously high resolution is as well. And I'm fully aware that the climate institutes have other priorities in developing earth system complexity and chemistry and so on, running ensembles and so on, and doing very long integrations. So this again comes down to the question, are the governments doing all they can to give climate scientists the technology uh, to, to, to reduce uncertainties to the minimum? And I think in Europe in particular, we are suffering very badly from in insufficient high-performance computing uh, for sorting these problems out. And I suspect it's true around the world. There are many petaflop computers now, but, but climate t typically tends to have to share uh, resources with other, many other applications. And if climate is really this burning problem, which it is indeed, then why are we not doing all we possibly can to really try and minimize these uncertainties. I don't think we'd, we are doing all we possibly can. As I say, seven out of 10 if I was a, a form master giving an end of term report. So I'm just gonna leave you with that uh, slide again so you can jot down the address to kind of sign on to the, to the network. But um, thank you for your attention and uh, I appreciate your, uh, your time. Thank you. Second. <laughs> have a little award here for Tim. <laughs> we have time for some questions. I'm going to ask you um, <coughs> to use the microphones which are set up. 
or somewhere I can just see. Uh, Tim has offered a challenge, of course, and uh, if you were impressed with uh, his talk, you will sign up. Uh, we'll see how many people sign up. So, <laughs> um, First question here. Could you go to the microphone, please? Sure. Um, the, uh, with the stochastic processing, it can, well, it can be applied at different levels. So on the one hand, you can treat the whole climate system as a stochastic system without looking at any of the physics. On, on the other hand, you can treat anything uh, deterministically. So in your opinion, for the future development of the, um, of the models, and you see the diagram with a single bubble of atmosphere with many, many bubbles at the end, the, the future direction is we should add more bubbles, and then for each bubble, you introduce some kind of stochastic modeling, or we should just focus on fewer bubbles and then treat anything else as stochastic. Um, no, clearly all these uh, bubbles are, are key key things that need to be incorporated in, into climate models. I mean, the, 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 the chemistry, the carbon cycle, and so on are important things. Um, the, the question is, uh, you know, you ha at some level, you have, to, you have to close, you know, this pr problem of model closure, and how do you do that? Uh, I mean, there is, I have to say, I mean, it's an unknown, people often ask me, you know, what is the optimal resolution for a model? I mean, should, in, in weather prediction, we now go down to about 20 kilometers, uh, but, you know, what about going down to uh, scales where the deep convective processes are actually um, uh, resolved, you know, at one kilometer or so on? Well, the truth of the matter is we just don't, don't know the answer to that, that question, um, whether, whether we can, you know, represent convection with stochastic closures or whether it's best to go down to that one kilometer. Then the micro, cloud microphysics would be represented stochastically. Um, we don't know that, and it's interesting that the, you know, the, the Navier-Stokes equations are actually, you know, n proving existence even of solutions to Navier-Stokes equations is one of the, the, the millennium mathematics problem prizes. So it's, it's a really difficult and fundamental problem to uh, kind of come up with an optimal, um, from, a, from a priori theoretical reasons, an optimal kind of configuration for a climate model. I just feel whatever, whatever that is, it has to, my, my own feeling now is that it has to have explicitly stochastic closure terms rather than deterministic ones. But Yeah, so I have a, I have a question about um, the comprehensiveness of the models versus predictability. Hmm. So, you know, it's clear and uh, when you know the equations really, really well, you still have a huge problem in terms of getting a complex model to, uh, to close and be predictable. So I'm wondering, given limited computation costs, um, how much effort should we put into making the models more comprehensive and how much effort should we put into making the parts that we do understand really, really well actually close? Yeah. Well, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, I, I personally feel the feedbacks with water, the water cycle, you know, water, vapor, and, and clouds are, are the, the single most important things to, to get right. And in some sense, the other feedbacks kind of flow on from that. Um, if cloud feedbacks turn out to be substantially negative, then perhaps you know, this, this climate change problem won't be the ca catastrophe. We won't be at the catastrophe end. So it's getting those cloud processes right. And I think that is where this synergy between weather and climate could play an in a much more um, important, uh, uh, could, could, could really be an important tool. Um, for example, y uh, yesterday um, I went to a talk by Ray Pierre Humbert, who I, I don't know if he's here in the audience or not, but. Um, where he was talking about the, the kind of fat tail of climate sensitivity out to five, six, seven, eight, nine, even 10 degrees, and the work of the climateprediction.net ensemble that were not really able to reduce uh, sensitivity out in those fat tails. Well, we've done some preliminary work using uh, data assimilation types of um, what are called analysis increment diagnostics, which you get in data assimilation. And we think we can rule out the parameterizations that led to those high climate sensitivities because the cloud processes, even just on time scales of a few hours, never mind centuries, those cloud processes very rapidly become unrealistic. The cloud, pro the cloud representations that have led to those very high climate sensitivities. So, you know, but this has to be done in a very kind of integrated way. You have to be using the same model for the data simulation as your long-term climate runs. And, um, you know, more work has to be done in that area. But I think this is an important tool. Uh, 
very briefly, you, you, you make a very good case for why stochastic processes should be implemented into climate models, but I, do, do you think it has to be an either or between a perturbed physics approach or a multi-model approach and, and the inclusion of stochastic, stochastic parameterizations? I mean, you still have somewhat yeah. arbitrary decisions to make in how the noise is implemented into, yeah. the, into the parameterization. Yeah. And, yeah. No, that, that's a good point. I mean, I, I'm not really advocating for a single, uh, you know, world model or anything like that. I just feel, for example, in Europe, we, we, we perhaps uh, have not, uh, you know, perhaps not reached an optimal stage. And for, certainly for parameters, I mean, I think there is still, you know, parameters, there's a certain epistemic uncertainty in parameters, i.e., you know, we just haven't made the right observations to nail them down that needs to be represented through, through perturbed parameter uncertainty. But I think where, where we go wrong is to assume that uh, this type of approach can adequately treat all of the kind of inherent structural assumptions we make when closing the equations. And that's where I think this stochastic approach can potentially open up a, a field that's hitherto not been well represented in these more traditional areas of representation. Okay, um, just uh, um, uh, your, your point about the separation of meteorologists and meteorology models and climate models is, is well taken. And, and the <clears throat> but I think there is also a separation between the climate modelers uh, at the, at the uh, high resolution scales uh, and the paleo um, climate uh, people. And I think if those communities would be brought together, um, that could also help in, in reducing the uncertainty that we have for for climate sensitivity and, and prediction, yeah. and I think that is probably one of the uh, three mm -hmm. points of your seven in, in ten uh, yeah. that are missing, and I think, yeah. you know, we, we know so much about the climate of the past, yeah. um, but typically uh, modelers that are doing that kind of paleo modeling, they are using very coarse resolution models, yeah. so I think it should be, be brought together, the, those two communities, and there's a real chance of reducing the uncertainty in the predictions. Yeah. I fully, fully agree, fully agree. Yeah, now that the cat is out, oh. Yeah. I enjoyed your talk uh, very Sorry. much. And uh, one question I have is, uh, towards the beginning of your lecture, you showed the, uh, the multi-model uh, projection of global warming spread yes. among various models. Yes. Now, the, in my opinion, most of spread is coming from a cloud feedback uncertainty, which you emphasize towards the end of your lecture. Yeah. And so suppose you change that to single model ensemble. Then the, in terms of centennial time scale, that spread will be greatly reduced. Yes. So that this suggests that spread is in no small part attributable to the uh, uh, uncertainty in the model of physics, particularly cloud feedback processes. And so uh, uh, the, uh, the beautiful proposal you have made yeah. about projection is applicable more uh, towards a up to uh, interdecadal time scale and which is a major, very challenging problem we're going to enjoy in future. Yeah, yeah. And many of the proposals, I would like to uh, propose that is applicable not yeah. at the centennial time scale projection, which is more forced rather than natural chaotic variability. What do you okay. think about that? Well, thank you. You've raised an interesting point. Peter's looking over at me uh, with like sort of Shut up very quickly. Um, if I could just say, I mean, I, I think the models differ. I mean, a model, the cloud feedback isn't a parameter in a model. I mean, the models differ because they have different representations of clouds, yeah. and these give rise to different feedbacks. Yeah. But uh, what I'm claiming is I think one could actually determine which of those models were any good or, or, or not by just looking at a few time steps yeah. of that model. So even though they differed on centennial timescales, the differences arise, I think, from initial, almost to the first few time steps in the cloud processes themselves. Yeah, but what I'm saying is... Uh, can, I, can I suggest, yeah. uh, uh, Suki, that you take this up? Uh, Tim is here for the next 
two days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim.